first uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Hassan Muhammad Ali. Dr. Hassan uh, uh, graduated from uh, Cairo University. He is a consultant of uh, anesthesia and ICU in uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to Rosham and happy to attend and to share in this uh, mega course. And I hope, I hope uh, my lecture will be uh, worthy and fruitful, inshallah, for all the colleagues. الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين. Okay, my lecture today is a very easy lecture and it's very basic lecture and primitive lecture. It is a target to the exam. Exam later on very soon. Okay, so this lecture is very exam related. The topic is introduction to vision and vision diagnosis. Okay. I will, I will try to speak English or through. I will, I will make it by English instead of me and for the audience to write This lecture is to reinforce and to reinforce how to think about the practical exam in your life. Okay? So uh, we make a topic of this point through a making of this. Okay? Usually it comes as a as an oral question, okay? And usually it uh, is a topic in the topic session or a topic session for free access from one to the other. In that the anatomy session, and then at the end it will finish by an applied anatomy through a, a vision and theory block. Or it may be a pharmacology lecture, and it will end at applied pharmacology in the form of regional blocks. Okay, so the way of thinking in the regional block should be a stepwise approach way of thinking. I mean, you should start from the indications, contraindications, anatomy, preparation, technique, complications like this, and I will go through these stations, and I will stop at each station, and I will just make a highlight or a focus, light focus on the points, on the keys, that way it may differ in the question and the exam or may differ in the practical uh, approach through your life, okay? Uh, first topic, indications and contraindications. Uh, you should mention and you should focus on the absolute contraindications. And uh, you should not forget to mention the patient refusal as the first contraindication. And you should not forget to mention that you should uh, 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 sign a consent after a follow and thorough explanation, explanation to your uh, patient about what you will do and what may happen after your block. Okay, it may be verbal or written consent according to your policy in the hospital. And uh, if you are attending an exam, you should mention the consent at the first step before any approach or anything. Uh, usually, the uh, trainee or the physician is very eager to go through the block. They will go to the anatomy, to the technique itself, and they will forget to just to mention that he will introduce himself to the patient and they will ask him to sign a consent or to has his uh, agreement to do the block after mentioning the benefits and the uh, side effects of these blocks. Okay, uh, another absolute contraindication is the local sepsis. And thirdly, allergy from the medications that may be given, okay? Uh, after this absolute contraindication, anything else is relative contraindication, it, it, and it will be a, a, a debatable point to discuss with the examiner. It will be a station to discuss with the examiner uh, and to uh, design for your patient, okay? 
patient selection is very important uh, indication and in the same time contraindication and you should choose your patient very cautiously uh, regarding his age, his medical condition and his personality. For instance, you can't go through uh, with a block uh, for a very young patient who is very anxious and very irritable and he cannot stay stable in the bed. Uh, it will be a hell, it will not be a block. The patient will jump from the table and he will shout and he will scream. And although you have a very solid and good block, but the patient is not happy with this, with this block. Uh, also, the patient personality, psychosis, for instance, if you have a psychotic patient uh, or Parkinsonian patient who has a lot of tremors and he cannot stay stable for, uh, on the bed, it's not wise at all to give him a local block, regional block. Uh, again, for the patient, if he has a renal function problem, like an acute kidney injury or renal impairment on the regular dialysis, it is not wise at all to give him a, a huge block uh, or a big volume of local anesthesia and you will uh, uh, put him on a topple like a local anesthesia toxicity, okay? So take care, acute kidney injury and renal failure. You should be very cautious and you should not go uh, except after uh, calculating very well the maximum dose of the local anesthesia. Surgeon and the procedure. Again, you should choose your patient very cautiously regarding the surgeon. You should know that the surgeon is very fast and the surgery is uh, uh, Coincided and co-opted with the co with the block. For instance, if the you will go through a supracondylar fracture and the patient will stay for four hours with a bad hand surgeon and he is lateral and you will give him a block. It's not a not a wise decision. Or if you decide to give the block and it's not covering all the dermatomes that the surgeon will go through, and so it is again uh, not wise to give the block. Okay. Anticoagulant is a very, very important issue and debatable issue, and we should discuss this, and we will discuss this in the next slides. Uh, anticoagulant and regional anesthesia. Uh, so it is a very good question. If I have a patient on therapeutic anticoagulation, he's a cardiac patient on a stent, and he is on Plavix, or he is in full anti-oral anticoagulant, what to do? Uh, first topic, or first sentence you should uh, state in, the, in your life and your exam that therapeutic anticoagulation needs to be assessed on an individual basis. I mean that every patient have his own story and his own situation, and you should tell, you should design your decision regarding his situations. Uh, another important, important issue, the oral anticoagulant. Till now, there is no guidelines, strict guidelines, for the oral anticoagulant, but some society, and they will mention it later, uh, said that you can uh, decide according to the half-lives, either after one half-life or two half-lives or three half-lives. Uh, what this means, half-life means that 50% of the drug concentration is disappeared or washed out after a uh, certain time. For instance, I will uh, 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 give a uh, uh, drug, say, uh, say it is X, drug X, and drug X will stay uh, one day, 24 hours in the stream, the blood stream. Uh, so after one day, 50% of the drug concentration will cleared out from the body. And then after two days, 75% uh, will be cleared out. And after three days, uh, 37, 87.5% uh, uh, will be cleared out. This is three half-lives. So some authors prefer to uh, give the block after one half-life, so 50% is cleared out. Two half-lives, so most of the, uh, the drug is cleared out, and so most of the okay? This uh, so that three half life is a Scandinavian society, and two half life is a European society. But till now, there is no solid in the guidelines for the oral anticoagulant. But you can mention uh, to the examiner who, through your life, if you face facing like a case like this, that you should decide either one half life or two or three, and you should have your rationale. Okay. Uh, as the American Society of Vision and Anesthesia recommends to the same guidelines for the peripheral nerve blocks as for neuroaxial procedure. Uh, this is the ASTRA recommendation, American Society. However, this recommendation uh, not preventing a hematoma. And there's a case report uh, that uh, there's a hematoma occurred in spite of adherence to the ASTRA guidelines. Again, there's a problem with the ASTRA guidelines. 
it is too restrictive to adapt the ASRA guidelines to new axial clocks to, uh, to it is very restrictive to adapt the ASRA guidelines uh, the same as the new axial blocks are the same as to the peripheral nerve blocks. It will be put you in a very tight situation. So we'll uh, again remember that every patient is a special case and you should design your decision according to that case. Okay. Uh, again, there is no, there have, be, there have been no prospective studies on the peripheral nerve blocks in the presence of the anticoagulants. Nobody till now make a study, good design study, randomized controlled study prospective. Uh, to uh, truly have a final decision, I should give or not the, my original blocks with this drug, with this dose or not, okay? Let's go to the European Society guidelines. For neuroaxial blocks, do not routinely apply guidelines. For neuroaxial blocks, do not routinely apply to peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, These are very, very hazy and very gray guidelines. They just mentioned no need to apply. So, so what to, to apply? There's no clear mentioning about this. The Australian Society for Anatelia uh, is a very good clue. It mentioned that superficial nerve blocks can be safely performed. They mean that if you will block uh, supraclav, enteroscaline, very superficial block, and you can see clearly the pleura and the vessels, and you can make a good compression over the patient. So you can go with the, with the block, even if you have a, a, a patient with a Therapeutic anticoagulation. However, if you will go through a deep block like celiac plexus block or paravertebral block, at that time you should go to uh, you should apply you should uh, apply the guidelines of the neuroaxial blocks. So at the end, give me the conclusion. I am now confused. What to give? Conclusion: individualization. Individualize the decision and discuss the risk and benefits of the block with the patient and with the surgeon. Okay. Uh, the American Society guidelines is applicable to block uh, in a, a vascular and non-compressible area such as celiac plexus blocks. And never, never to forget that you should follow up your patient closely after the block placement, okay? This is very important. Uh, if you have the wrong decision, uh, you should know how to correct your wrong decision. So, so follow up is a very important after the patient uh, giving the block. This will uh, drive us to another question. So what are the symptoms of hematoma or uh, bleeding after the block? This is very easy, two symptoms that are contradictory. Either the patient will, fe will feel a severe pain after the block. On the other hand, he will feel a sensory motor deficit. I mean that the patient after the uh, expected duration of the block, for instance, four hours, six hours, the block will be maintained. Or the patient have a partial release from the block or had the partial release and then re-blocked again. This is a very bad sign, and that it means that the patient had a, something happened in the nerve uh, bundle, and maybe hematoma happened, and you should follow up and find the cause. Okay. Uh, two other points: declining hemoglobin and the hypotension, which is very rare, and you can see it in uh, deep blocks like celiac plexus, like this. Okay. Definite diagnosis after examination and uh, investigation will be a CT. Okay, and also one can help especially in superficial blocks. Another debatable question, awake or asleep? Is it wise to make the, the block while the patient is awake? Or is it wise to put a, uh, give him a deep sedation or even to put him under an athedia and G, under GA and to give him the block? So in this slide, I put the pros with red green and the cause with, uh, the pros with green in color and the, uh, the cones with red color. If you, uh, are with, the, with those who like to give the patient awake, you can say to me, verbal contact with patient facilitate early recognition and management. If the patient is fully awake, I can early, early and soonly detect the complication like pneumothorax or like hematoma or intraneural injury. The patient will shout and will have uh, will has uh, severe numbness in something wrong. On the other hand, if you are with those people who like to put the patient sleep or give him under GA or under deep sedation, uh, you can say that it's easy, very easy to perform with the patient while the perfect, uh, while the patient is under GA. Uh, another point that uh, in mediatric surgery, in mediatric anesthesia, we did um, a lot, a lot of cases, uh, called pox and renal pox under GA, which is a must in mediatric anesthesia and with a very, very, very little uh, complications, maybe 1.5 to 1,000. So why not to go with the adult also with the same procedures? 
there will be also very few complications, very few instances of complications. Uh, those who is against the sleep or under, uh, against the uh, support, the idea of to, to give the patient the block while he is uh, uh, under GA or under heavy sedation, uh, they mentioned that anhedia under heavy sedation will hide parativia or intraneural injection. And there's a multiple case reports of catastrophic complications like pneumothorax or intrathecal injection happened while the patient was under GA or under sedation and nobody uh, know that uh, the patient goes through a complication except after the after the end of the surgery. Again, uh, it is a big mess, and I am not conf I'm now confused what to do: awake or asleep. So the conclusion message is: perform blocks on awake patients whenever possible, and never, never, never to for forget to document what happened. Okay, document the instance and manage the instance. Okay. Uh, now we we'll go to the. Second, the third station, which is preparation. I will not go in details, but again, preparation, you should uh, have in your mind a clear clues to set in uh, your exam and to do in your life. And not to forget, not to go fast into the block itself and to forget to say that I should have a consent, I should be safe, I should have, I should prepare my crash trolley, my airway, equi my airway equipment, I should put all, put all the, monitor, uh, the monitoring over the patient, I should put an oxygen mask over my patient. I should be uh, fully sterilized and the technique should be under full aseptic precautions. And don't forget just to mention that you have uh, prepared your intralipid, your antidote of the, uh, of the regional prox toxicity. And you know where is, where is it exactly in your hospital, okay? Uh, nerve location. This is another station, another question that may be asked and you, you may face in your practice. How to localize the nerve? There are a lot of techniques. The, now, the most uh, commonly uh, technique is the ultrasound. She is now established, uh, established and uh, a definite uh, way of uh, localizing the nerve blocks, the nerve. And in old days, there was a nerve locator, parathelia, and even the anatomical landmark, and even by the X-ray or CT. So you should know about the history of the nerve blocks, how to locate by anatomy, how to locate by X-ray, how to locate by parathelia or even nerve locator. But now ultrasound is the main stream and the gold standard ultrasound is the, the only way that you should practice with, okay? Only way that uh, Pharmacology. I will not again go through a deep, a deep, uh, a deep details uh, in pharmacology, but when you are making a block or when you are mentioning the block to your examiner, you should put in your mind four, uh, four words or four sentences. The type of the medication, what is the type of the medication? Pubivacaine, Ribivacaine, Xylocaine, or a mix of them, okay? The dose of the, of the medication, and at this time, he will ask you what is the maximum do dose of this medication, so you should keep in mind the maximum dose. And the volume, you will inject. Some blocks need a big volumes, and it's a, a volume dependent, like fascia iliaca and like tab block. And lastly, the dilution. And the elution is very important to, uh, uh, to decide this block will be an anesthetic block or analgesic block for post-operative analgesia or for intraoperative anesthesia, okay? If the examiner asks you about the adjuvants, what you will add to your block, that means that he is very happy about your approach and now he's going with you through uh, deep details. There's a lot, a lot of uh, drugs that uh, added to the block that it will increase, increase the duration and uh, the potency of the block. The most famous now and the most recent, uh, recently used is the dexamethasone and the Presidex. So if, if, you, if you need to read about these adjuvants, you, it is enough to read about dexamethasone and the Presidex and no need to uh, lose your time in more than these two drugs, okay? Anatomy, again, I will not go to the to details, uh, but I will mention three slides or four slides regarding the anatomy just to uh, highlight a very important points regarding the anatomy. Uh, just to remember that in my cervical plexus, uh, in my cer cer uh, cervical spines, I have eight spines, uh, eight roots, and so the upper four roots is for the cervical block, uh, is uh, for the cervical plexus, and the lower uh, four roots is for the brachial plexus. So it is very easy to remember that my cervical, uh, my brachial plexus is from the C5, 6, 7, 8, which is the four lower. Uh, a, the four lower roots from the eight cervical roots, okay? 
and don't forget to have to mention that t1 will have a contribution okay uh then this slide is very important slide uh, a, a common question or common uh, issue that what side what level of the block i actually block uh, what level of the plex of the plexus i actually block if you can see in this slide here it is a cervical spine and then this is the roots and then after the roots you will have the trunk of the plexus and then the divisions and then the cordial and then the terminal branches so if your needle is here, which is the interscaline, you are blocking trunks. If your needle is here, which is supraclav, you are blocking divisions or trunks. If your needle is here, infraclavicular block, you are blocking roots, cords. And if you, your needle is here at the axilla, you are blocking terminal branch. Actually, after using the ultrasound, it is not sharply like this. We'll not mention any deep details, but if you put your probe here in this area, supraclavicular area, and you tilt your probe upstairs, you can see the trunks and the roots. And if you tilt it down like this, you can see the cords. So uh, it's not any, uh, it is not more uh, like before, uh, ultrasound changing the anatomy and changing the, uh, the conception and the perception of the anatomy. But roughly, if you put your probe or your needle, supraclav, it is trunks, Infraclave, it is codes uh, at the arm determined branch. Okay, and this is enough for the beginners to, to know about the precal plex. Again, here are the circular and number plexes, the same uh, rule as we have mentioned in the cervical plexus, we'll mention in the, in the lumbar and the sacral. The first four roots from the lumbar uh, roots um, uh, composing the lumbar plex. So L1, L2, L3, L4. And don't forget that I will have branch from L5 and the branch from T1, T12, okay? And so the sus subsequent four roots, which is L4, L5, S1, S2, forming the sacrum, the sacral plexus, and I will have a contribution from the S3, S4, and L4, okay? This is not a very scientific approach to remember the anatomy, but at least it will uh, make you remembering the, uh, the anatomy easily, okay? Technique. This is uh, my surprise in this lecture. There is no technique. I will not discuss any techniques. It's, I, I have mentioned before, it is just an, an introduction to the blocks, uh, to the nerve blocks. And in details, we'll inshallah later on discuss every block and every technique and all the different approaches and what the pros and the cons. But at this time, just put in your mind the way of thinking that I will prepare, I will have a concern, I will be safe, I know my drug, I know how to go through, I know the anatomy, and I know how to manage my complication. The technique itself is very sophisticated, and it's not our point to discuss today. And even the examiner, if he, if you are safe, if you are safe, and you are uh, 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 systematized, he will be happy, okay? I think we need to finish complications. Uh, complication is related to, related to anatomy. Just to remember that the structure be, uh, in, 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 in approximate to my needle will be injured, like the nerve itself. Nerve near to my nerve, like the front nerve in the supraclav, hematoma, vessel itself, and organ like pneumothorax and esophagus. The most important complication that you should keep in your mind and you should mention it clearly and you know how to approach it to, through in the local and toxicity. So I am put it in a, green, a red color and I will discuss it briefly. The causes of the local and toxicity, uh, very easy, you can imagine by yourself, drug overdose, you, cal you calculated the dose wrongly and, and uh, like uh, uh, secondly, you are injecting endovascularly and take care if you are in proximity with a CNS, like if you're making stead ganglion block, even 20 milligrams of uh, local anesthesia is enough, enough of xylocaine is enough to make epilepsy and toxicity. So uh, don't uh, uh, underestimate the intravascular injection, even uh, if it is a low, small doses. Okay. Uh, rapid absorption or injection too highly to a vascular area like intercostal space. This area is very vascular and so to absorb fastly. The local anesthesia, continuous infusion. You may miss 
uh, the dose by continuous infusion and give you can, you can give you may give a big dose uh, like uh, if you put the patient on a catheter and infusion catheter okay and if you are very brave to give a dose and dose and dose you give the first dose it's patchy block and not solid block and you're not happy and so you will give another dose and third dose and so the subsequent the, the sequel will be at a catastrophe you will face a local and fear toxicity so uh, how to diagnose uh, here this uh, 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 this slide is very rough slide a collection of symptoms and signs I will mention them firstly, and I, I just need you to remember that local and toxicity is uh, two phases, stimulation and then inhibition. And in your usual practice, if you give spinal anesthesia, the patient will feel numbness and hotness, and then he will do every sensation. So his first, firstly, stimulation. Secondly, will be uh, inhibition. So uh, the patient will feel in his, in his mouth and his lips, numbness and tingling, and then he will go to agitation, which is a stimulation, and then convulsion, very, very, very uh, strong stimulation, and then coma, depression, disregarding the CNS, running the heart, tachycardia, and then arrhythmia, and then the stimulation, and then lastly, inhibition, arrest. Okay? Respiratory arrest may be from the either CNS uh, coma or from the uh, uh, cardiac arrest. Okay? Uh, we'll, I will mention briefly a case scenario that you have a patient with local block and you give a big dose and then he will feel uh, a tingling and numbness in his mouth. He will not mention the, this numbness because this is something easy I mean, not astonishing. And then he will be agitated. And so you will say to yourself, uh, you will say to yourself, he is a young patient, he's anxious, I will give him Dormicam, Midazolam. If you give him Midazolam, so we will make a bridge over the convulsion stage, and you will go directly to the coma stage, and you'll find your patient suddenly arrested with a respiratory arrest, and you don't know what the cause, okay? Inshallah, I will finish soon. Uh, what to do? Three steps not to forget to say. You should say the three steps. Stop infusion, call for help, and do ABC. After that, mention anything else. If you say, I will stop the infusion, I will call for help, I will make ABC, and then blah, 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 your examiner will be happy. And even in your life, your patient will be safe, okay? Uh, last slide, inshallah, we'll finish. Uh, what is the dose and protocol of intralipid? Uh, there are a lot of protocols, and this one, I adopt this protocol. Uh, very easy. Bolus 1.5 milligram per kg over one minute, and then 0.25 milliliter per kg uh, as an infusion, okay? After five minutes, again, re redo the loading dose and duplicate the infusion, maximum as 12 milliliter per kg, okay? I finish, thank you. Any questions? 36 minutes, okay. Finished, Hello. any questions?